Okay, everyone. I must warn you. If you are easily scared by phantoms, or if you're offended by dark stories, now is the time for you to stop and exit this tour of Manor House. Otherwise, you enter at your own risk. Discretion is advised. This presentation is produced by Manor House Productions. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our video, and leave a comment while you're there. Visit manorhouseshow.com and sign up for the RIP section, where you'll receive Manor House exclusives not found here or anywhere else. Your plot is waiting. And if you make it out alive after tonight's tale, you will have the option of renting a room for the night here at Manor House. It will be an experience you'll never forget. Tonight's tale is A Year of Sight by Frederick Obermeyer. Frederick Obermeyer enjoys writing science fiction, fantasy, horror, and crime stories. He has had work published in NFG, Electric Spec, New Myths, Perihelion SF, Acidic Fiction, The Destination Future Anthology, and other markets. To read all the exclusive author interviews, visit our website, manorhouseshow.com. Follow Manor House on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, and like us on Facebook. Follow me. The Phantom Collector awaits. Welcome. Come in. Don't be scared. At least, not yet. Let's play a game. In my hand, I hold eight cards. You pick four, and whichever four you pick will determine your fate. Ready? One, two, three, four. Good. You picked four kings, otherwise known as the Four Horsemen. Conquest, war, famine, and my personal favorite, death. Mm, today's not your lucky day. I'll let you in on a little secret. They were all kings. Unfair, you say? Wait until you hear tonight's brutal betrayal. Our tale takes place in the kingdom of Bardenio. It's the annual lottery known as Sight Day. The king will play, the blind will see, and people will die. Gather round. Look into the light. Look. Look deep. Open your imagination and listen to the story called A Year of Sight. My name is Kenneth Thale. Until my fourteenth year, my world had been one of darkness, and although I eventually regained my sight for many years thereafter, I am now an old man. The light is dimming one last time, and my memories are fading as I approach the end of my life. I have paid a mimic a sizable fortune to use his magic to sharpen my remaining recollections but even his powers can only do so much. So, before blindness and death take me, I will commit my tales to parchment, starting with this one. I do this not only as a means of expiating my many sins, but also to help keep the memories alive in my mind.
early on the morning of the annual sight day. My mother stopped our horse and cart in the village Wissick, outside the walls of the king's castle. We are here, Kinnis. Yes, I know. Although I had been born blind, I could clearly tell that we had arrived. The sounds and smells of Wissick were that familiar to me. The cry of a merchant hawking the day's catch, the stink from chimney smoke and piles of horse excrement, the bark of dogs, the general bustle of people. I snatched up my walking stick, felt my way to the back of the cart, and started to climb down when my mother grabbed my arm and tried to help me. Though she meant well, I hated the idea of being led around like some helpless cripple. I can do it myself. I'm sorry, Kinnis. I just don't want you to break your arm again. Irritated, I pushed her aside and marched forward with my stick. However, I only managed a few steps before I tripped and stumbled onto the muddy ground. Nearby, a few people laughed, and my face grew hot with shame. Easy. Let me go! Kinnis, this is very important for us. Please, just let me hold on to you so you don't get hurt. I sighed, recalling the urgency of our task. Three months earlier, my father had been killed in the last border skirmish with the kingdom of Gazinthia. My older sister, Amarlis, tried to work the farm, but it was far too grueling for a young girl like her. Incited workers from the Bardenio kingdom and abroad cost too much to keep for very long. So my family needed me to work the land and earn enough money for us to survive and hire more workers. And to do that, I needed both sight and the contest prize. Together, it would be enough to keep our farm going for several years. Yes, mother. I let her take my arm and guide me. Do not worry. Everything will be all right. We only have a one in five chance of losing, and I am certain that the gods will favor... Mother, you're babbling. Sorry. I bowed my head as she led me onward. Moments later, the mindless chatter of the citizenry grew louder, and from their words, I knew we were entering the castle grounds. Thousands of cursed blind people like myself came from around the Bardenio kingdom to play the noble-born's game of sight. Soon after the crowd gathered, I heard the nearby people say that King Pasendor and his right-hand man, Seer Yendrick, were coming onto the stage. What followed was hours of boring pomp and circumstance as the king and his chief seer droned on about the history of Sight Day. The only memorable aspect of the interminable ceremony was the story of the curse that led to the holiday. The once great wizard, Tal Darrow, had a beautiful son named Sivan. But Savan and his male lover were caught one day in a glade, accused of buggery and condemned to death. Extremely old and no longer quite as powerful as he had once been, Taldero had pleaded with the king to spare their lives and allow them to secretly go into exile. In response, the king blinded the lovers with hot pokes and allowed the public to slowly torture them to death in the castle courtyard as a warning to those who would dare break the laws of both nature and man. Enraged, 
Taldero used the last of his magic to curse the noble born, all the citizens of the kingdom, and 10,000 of their descendants at random to a lifetime of blindness for the next hundred generations. Such a curse killed the old wizard, but its power held strong long after the man's death, and even modern wizards could not combat it. Taldero designed the curse so that the only way it could be temporarily cured was for a blind person to kill another. Having done so, the murderer would gain one year of sight. Each following murder would give the killer yet another year. Blood for blood were Taldero's last words whispered to his scribe. Thus, people such as myself continued to suffer for the deeds of our ancestors. After the ceremony, the nobleborn held the drawing. Out of thousands of blind men, only 50 could play the game in a day. I could feel my mother's arm tighten around me as the lottery numbers were called her breath quickening. Towards the end, our own number was called, and my mother sighed. Whether it was from relief, or terror, or both emotions, I could not say. Those who have been selected, please remain in the courtyard. Those who have not, you may enjoy the festivities in the village. I could hear several disgruntled moans and whispered oaths as they left. We did it. Gods, what if we... Calm down, mother. An official called each lottery winner up, and we waited for hours until finally our turn came. My heart quickened as my mother led me out of the courtyard and down a narrow, dank hallway. Would I really have to kill my mother? I thought. I could forfeit the game at any point. But the cost would be my mother's sight and our freedom. Ten years in the castle's dungeon. A place where few ever survived the daily tortures. Judging from the cool drafts blowing around me, I deduced we were in the auditorium. The scent of incense hung thick in the room, making me cough. Step forward. We obeyed Yendrik's command without hesitation. Rumors abounded of the seer's great magic and his near-omnipotent second sight. Almost as great as Toldero's, some claimed. Many would-be criminals in Bardenio had tried to kill others to gain one or more years' worth of sight, but Yendrik's visions had allowed the king's men to capture nearly all of these illegal murderers and take their eyes as punishment. Only the king could legally sanction murder for sight, and then he typically only did it on sight day. Welcome, my loyal subjects. Thank you for having us, your majesty. I felt her bow. A moment later, she forced me to do the same. Jasna and Kinestale, are you ready to begin? Yes, your majesty. Guards, take her to the next chamber. Suddenly, my hand tightened on her, fear rising in me. Be brave, my son. Everything will be fine. Her thin arms swung around me as tight as an iron band. Afraid that I might never feel her warm embrace again, I hugged her tightly. She kissed me fully on the lips and rubbed my back with both hands. I shuddered, feeling the tension in her body. Normally such wanton affections from her in public embarrassed me, but the grave circumstances of the moment obviated such fears. 
She only parted from me when others pulled us away. I love you, my child. As I love you. She burst into tears, and my heart sank as I recalled how shabbily I had often treated her. I heard her fumbling footsteps as they led her into the hanging chamber. Two former players in our home had once described the hanging chamber as a room with a wooden platform that had five nooses. Outside the chamber lay the king's auditorium. On stage were five wooden levers connected to five trap doors in the next room. Four random people and someone close to the player were bound, gagged, and noosed. The player had to choose one of the levers and pull on it to execute the victim. No matter who they chose, someone would die and the player would get a year of sight in return. The trick was not to kill the person dearest to you. Typically, the victims were common criminals, prisoners of war, the lame, the feeble-minded, and the poor. Although sometimes a disgraced nobleborn also had his head placed in a noose. My hands began trembling and sweating. Would I be able to kill my own mother? We knew the risks and had accepted them. But when the moment came, could I do it? Some people froze up when making a choice of who to kill. Their conscience would not allow them to murder another, despite the dire consequences. Guinness Thale, I now place five stones in your hand. Drop one, and that will be the lever that you will pull. Do you understand? Yes, my liege. Someone placed five stones into my hands. They all felt smooth against my palm, as if they had been sanded down. Which one meant death for my mother? Drop a stone now, lad. I took a deep breath, shuffled the stones around in my hand, and let one go. It clattered dully to the floor. As it did, I silently prayed to the gods that I had made the right choice. I heard someone picking up the fallen stone while another took the other stones out of my hands, and a third led me over to the lever and placed my sweaty hand on it. Breath caught in my lungs like a spider's cobwebs. I tried to remain calm, but I imagined my mother's final muffled cry as the noose tightened and broke her neck. It did not seem real. I wanted to tear my hand away and run screaming from this awful room. You have one minute to pull the lever. I cannot do this, I thought. If I kill my mother, then I will kill myself. My hand shook, and I could hear eager whisperings, laughs, and sighs from the crowd as the seconds dwindled away. This was apparently the nobleborn's idea of grand entertainment, watching the laity agonize over such a morbid choice. Do it, Kenneth. You have four chances to succeed, but somebody will die. Possibly her. If you don't, she will lose her sight and will die in the dungeons. Thirty seconds. My breath quickened. I considered forfeiting, but I could not bear to hear my mother's screams as they burned out her eyes. Twenty seconds. I pulled the lever. I lurched back from the lever, collapsed and swallowed hard, trying not to vomit. Sour acid burned my throat like hellfire. As I coughed, the darkness lifted and became a gray blur, which then resolved into the image of a gray stone floor. It was surely not the most glorious sight ever, but after 14 years of blindness, it was beautiful beyond words. I can see! Gods, I can see! Overwhelmed, I burst into tears and looked at my rough white hands. I turned them over and touched the cold floor and my face. Shaking, I looked around the gray stone auditorium. 
the wooden stage and the five levers, the nobles sitting above me, dressed in their green and gold finery, the blue sky and white clouds outside the nearest window. Such beautiful sights. They so overwhelmed me that I almost forgot the price I had to pay for them. Almost. Mother, does she live? See for yourself. I hesitated, remembering that I had never seen what my mother looked like before, nor did I wish for the first sight of my mother to be her corpse. Two burly guards forced the issue, however, when they dragged me towards the next room. Shaking, I closed my eyes. The door whined open, and the brutes shoved me forward into the room. Open your eyes, lad. Instead, I clamped them shut, the terrified, muffled cries of the victims filling my ears. Open them. The guards forced my eyes open. One figure, a young blonde man, was dangling from the rope beneath the platform, his neck broken. He had a pea branded into his left cheek, indicating that he was a pederast. Back then, my blindness prevented me from reading, and I did not understand the letter or its meaning. Urine and excrement had stained his pants, and the smell was so nauseating that I nearly vomited. My mother lived... Yet my joy at her survival was tempered by the gruesome sight before me. The other four were standing on the platform, shaking and sobbing. One was a feeble-minded young woman, her gray tunic soiled with filth. Next was a feral-looking young boy with numerous pox scars on his face and a T for thief branded into his left cheek. A balding man was third, and he was whimpering through his gag. Finally, there was a woman with long, straight brown hair. Though I had never seen her before, I knew it was my mother when she yelped through the gag and tried to move towards me. However, her bonds and her noose kept her trapped on the platform. Mother! I tried to go to her, but the other guards held me back. What are you doing? The brutes practically flung me out of the room and locked the door. I screamed and tried to lunge back to her, but one of them hit me in the stomach with a truncheon. Pain burst through my belly and I sagged to the floor. I caught Seer Yendrick whispering into the king's ear. You have won your sight and the prize of 500 gold sovereigns. But by divine right, I ask for one more game. Your Majesty, please. The next game will be one in three. Since you have won fairly, I give you permission to leave in peace with your mother and the money. But after one year, your sight will disappear and you will be banned from playing the game. However, if you agree and win, I will give you royal sanction to kill one commoner each year, and keep your sight for as long as you live. The guards yanked me back to my feet. I gasped and swallowed hard. Sight for a lifetime. I looked around, drinking in everything with my eyes. The odds were one in three. I had won once, yet the risk was greater. Leave, I thought. One year of sight is enough to work the farm, and the money is more than enough to keep the farm going thereafter. But once the year was up, I would lose my sight forever. True, I could kill others, but Yendrick would catch me, and the king's men would surely take my eyes. Perhaps even my life as well. I give you one minute to decide. I swallowed hard, my mind teetering between the choices. Every instinct said, leave, don't be a fool. 
but if I walked away from this now, I would eventually lose my sight again. One in three. Not the greatest odds ever to be sure, but at least it was not one in two. But what about the other victims in that room? What about their right to live? It wouldn't matter, though. They were probably dead anyway. If I didn't kill them, someone else would. Still, I felt sick at my own greed. If I threw another life away just to see, I would be finally condoning their vicious game. But I had killed once before. Killing again wouldn't be so hard. I had only to pull a lever. Yet, losing my mother filled me with such great fear that I dug my nails into my palms till I drew blood. I started to open my mouth when I saw a small blue bird fly onto the stone sill of one of the theater's high windows. Even now, all these years later, it was one of the most beautiful sights I have ever seen. It looked at me with its tiny black eyes, chirped a sweet tune, and then took flight. If I refused now, I would never be able to see a bird again after the year was up. And as much as my greed sickened me, I couldn't bear to give up my sight now that I had it. I accept the challenge. Very well, Kittis Thale. The king gestured to the guards and they went into the next room. A few minutes later, they emerged and nodded to the king, who then nodded to Yendrick. The seer came down from the platform, in the hand, carrying a blindfold and three stones. One was amber, another was opal, and the third was soapstone, each color corresponding to a band painted on top of each lever. Nearby, a page was holding an hourglass with five second increments marked in black on the glass. Yendrick put a blindfold around my eyes, my throat constricted as the darkness returned and he placed the stones in my left hand. It took all of my nerve not to tear the blindfold from my eyes. Drop one now. I took a deep breath and did so. The blindfold was taken off. I looked down and saw the opal lying on the ground. You have made your choice. Go and pull the lever. Once again, my legs were frozen. Helplessly, I kept looking at the stone. Yendrick walked over to the page, took the hourglass from him, flipped it, and put it on a nearby stone table. You now have one minute. Torn from my stupor, I trudged over to the opal lever. My hands shook uncontrollably as I gripped it. Pull. My hand wouldn't respond, though. Thirty seconds. A sick dread arose inside me as I stared down at the handle. My throat tightened and I tottered, wondering if I was mad. How could I risk my mother's life over a lifetime worth of sight? There was no turning back, though. I had to finish the game or forfeit everything. Ten seconds. Unable to escape my fate, I pulled the lever. Disgusted with myself, I moaned and covered my eyes with my free hand. What had I done? For several seconds after, I held onto the lever, unable to let go. I dragged my feet, not wanting to go back in there and see what had happened. Please. It was all I could say, yet my plea did not move them. They threw open the door. My mother hung from the end of the rope, her neck broken.
I do not know how long I screamed. Seconds, perhaps? Maybe even a minute? It seemed like hours, though. I screamed until Yendrick made a motion with his hand to his throat and one of the guards struck me in the windpipe. When I recovered a little while later, I staggered over to her corpse, gripped it, and tried to push her corpse up as if I could somehow unbreak her neck and bring her back to life. Madness, of course. I clung to her body and wailed, more guards took the other prisoners out of the room, and Yendrick's brute stood close to him, ready to pounce at his command. The seer sauntered up to me, his face beaming like a contented child. It was the same expression he was wearing right before I took his head. But that is another story for another time. As I near the end of my tale, my mind wavers, and I can feel the memory slipping away. I must write the rest down before it fades into oblivion. A shame, lad. Such are the vagaries of fate. You knew all along that I would kill her. He kept the same infuriating smile on his face. You will be pleased to know that some good has come from her death. Good? What good? I glared at him. Yendrick gestured to his two guards. They rushed up, tugged my hands behind my back, and bound me. Another put a grain sack over my head. I tried to pull free but their strength was too great as they carried me away. What good, damn you? You have gained three more years of sight from the deaths of your mother and the unborn twin children. You sired with her. King and Seer Yendrick really get off on sight day. It's the one day of the year where they can be charitable and despicable at the same time. Poor Kennis, though. He'll have to hang around the gallows a little longer while the King continues playing his game. But don't worry. As we heard, Kennis will come up aces in the end. My turn to pick a card. Oh. I got the Joker. Very funny. I hope you enjoyed tonight's tale. Until the next one. Won't you stay the night? <laughs> <laughs>